Hello Year 5 and let's begin Lesson 19 of Destination Reader. We're going to continue reading Matilda by Roald Dahl. Remember, the keywords are in red, questions for you to answer are in blue, and writing time is in green. Please check you have a copy of the story, a strategy prompt sheet, a pencil and a piece of paper or your home learning book. We're going to continue with strategy number four. We're introducing a new strategy today, evaluating. I would like you to have a think about what does it mean to evaluate a text? Record your answer in your home learning book and then press play once you are ready to continue. Evaluating means to comment on the quality of a text and saying why. It's okay if you didn't get this answer straight away because we haven't actually yet covered this technique before. I would like you to think about now why good readers evaluate a text. Record your answer in your home learning book. Again, you may not get the perfect answer but just try your best. Well done. Good readers evaluate texts while they read to make deeper connections and develop a better understanding of the text and the author's choices. Let's have a look at our vocabulary for today. Infernal. Infernal, which means irritating and tiresome. Indelible, indelible, which means to make marks that cannot be removed. So you're making marks on something that cannot be removed, kind of like staining. Insolence, insolence which is rude and disrespectful behaviour, and wrench, wrench, which is a sudden violent twist or pull. We will come across these words as we read today. Today, I will be asking questions for you to answer. Look carefully at how many marks each question is worth. We're focusing on two and three mark questions today. Why might evaluating questions usually be two or three mark questions rather than one mark questions? I would like you to have a think about your answer. Perhaps you could have a discussion at home. And then I would like you to make a note of your answer in your home learning book or on your piece of paper. Press play once you are ready. Great. We know that with evaluating questions, we're going to need to make a point and we're going to need to explain why. Therefore, the questions are going to be two or three mark answers. Let's recap how to answer two and three mark questions. Press pause now to have a think about it and then press play when you are ready. Well done. Two mark questions need a P, E answer, point and evidence. Three mark questions need a P, E, E answer, point, evidence and explanation. Remember your main point is what you think, your evidence is backing up your main point, and then you need to explain this in detail. Let's take a look at this picture from what we read yesterday. We can see Miss Trunchbull is pulling or holding up Rupert by his hair. And you can see the children in the background look quite shocked and quite scared. We're going to see what happens next in our chapter today. We're on page 144. I will read and you will follow along. We will stop at points to give you time to evaluate. 
And well, it might be if he doesn't stop wriggling, snorted the trunchbull. Keep still, you squirming worm. It really was a quite extraordinary sight to see this giant headmistress dangling the small boy high in the air and the boy spinning and twisting like something on the end of a string and shrieking his head off. Say it, bellowed the trunchbull. Say two sevens of fourteen. Hurry up or I'll start jerking you up and down and then your hair really will come out and we'll have enough of it to stuff a sofa. Get on with it, boy. Say two sevens of fourteen and I'll let you go. Two sevens of... Fourteen, gasped Rupert, whereupon the trunchbull, true to her word, opened her hand and quite literally let him go. He was a long way off the ground when she released him, and he plummeted to the earth and hit the floor and bounced like a football. Get up and stop whimpering, the trunchbull barked. Rupert got up and went back to his desk, massaging his scalp with both hands. The trunchbull returned to the front of the class. The children sat there, hypnotised. None of them had seen anything quite like this before. It was splendid entertainment. It was better than a pantomime, but with one big difference. In this room, there was an enormous human bomb in front of them, which was liable to explode and blow someone to bits any moment. The children's eyes were riveted on the headmistress. I don't like small people, she was saying. Small people should never be seen by anybody. They should be kept out of sight in boxes like hairpins and buttons. I cannot, for the life of me, see why children have to take so long to grow up. I think they do it on purpose. Another extremely little, brave little boy in the front row spoke up and said, But surely you were a small person once, Miss Trunchbull, weren't you? I was never a small person, she snapped. I have been large all my life and I don't see why others can't be the same way. But you must have started out as a baby, the boy said. Me? A baby, shouted the trunchbull. How dare you suggest such a thing? What cheek, what infernal insolence. What's your name, boy? And stand up when you speak to me. The boy stood up. My name is Eric Ink, Miss Trunchbull, he said. Eric what? The trunchbull shouted. Ink, the boy said. Don't be an arse, boy. There's no such name. Look in the phone book, Eric said. You'll see my father there under Ink. Very well, then the trunchbull said. You may be ink, young man, but let me tell you something. You're not indelible. I'll very soon rub you out if you try getting clever with me. Spell what? I don't understand, Eric said. What do you want me to spell? Spell what, you idiot? Spell the word what? W-O-T, Eric said, answering too quickly. There was a nasty silence. I'll give you one more chance, the trunchbull said, not moving. Ah, yes, I know, Eric said. It's got an H in it, W-H-O-T. It's easy. In two large strides, the trunchbull was behind Eric's desk, and there she stood, a a pillar of doom towering over the helpless boy. Eric glanced fearfully back over his shoulder at the monster. I was right, wasn't I? He murmured nervously. You were wrong, the trunchbull barked. In fact, you strike me as a sort of poisonous little pockmark that will always be wrong. You sit wrong, you look wrong, you speak wrong, you are wrong all round. I will give you one more chance to be right. Spell what? We're going to pause here to have a look at our first question. How is the author trying to impact the reader through Miss Trunchbull's repetition of the word wrong for two marks? Say your answer out loud and then make a note of your ideas on your piece of paper or in your home learning book and press play once you are ready. Let's take a look at my answer. Repetition of the word wrong works well because it reinforces Miss Trunchbull's negative thoughts towards Eric. This helps to show the reader how silly Miss Trunchbull Eric, th- th- sorry, Miss Trunchbull thinks Eric is. Okay, so I've made my point of why the repetition works well, or how it's trying to impact the reader, and I've also said what it reinforces. Remember, we haven't covered evaluating yet, so your answers may be different, and you may not be a hundred percent sure. But just give it your best shot. Let's continue. Eric hesitated. 
Then he said very slowly, it's not W-O-T and it's not W-H-O-T. Ah, I know, it must be W-H-O-T-T. Standing standing behind Eric, the trunchbull reached out and took hold of the boy's two ears, one with each hand, pinching them between forefinger and thumb. Ow! Eric cried. Ow, you're hurting me! I haven't started yet, the trunchbull said briskly. And now, taking a firm grip on his two ears, she lifted him bodily out of his seat and held him aloft. Like Rupert before him, Eric squilled the house down. From the back of the classroom, Miss Honey cried out, Miss Trunchbull, don't! Please let him go! His ears might come off! They'll never come off, the Trunchbull shouted back. I have discovered through long experience, Miss Honey, that the ears of small boys are stuck very firmly to their heads. Let him go, Miss Trunchbull, please, begged Miss Honey. You could damage him, you really could. You could wrench them right off. Ears never come off, the Trunchbull shouted. They stretch most marvellous, marvellously like these are doing now, but I can assure you that they never come off. Eric was squealing louder than ever and peddling the air, air with his legs. Matilda had never before seen a boy, or anyone else for that matter, held aloft by his ears alone. Like Miss Honey, she felt sure both his ears were going to come off at any moment with all the weight that was on them. The trunchbull was shouting, the word what is spelled W-H-A-T. Now spell it, you little wart. Eric didn't hesitate. He had learnt from watching Rupert a few minutes before that the quicker you answered, the quicker you were released. W-H-A-T, he squealed. Spells what? Still holding him by the ears, the trunchbull lowered him back into his chair behind his desk. Then she marched back to the front of the class, dusting off her hands, one against the other, like someone who had been handling something rather grimy. That's the way to make them learn, Miss Honey, she said. You take it from me. It's no good just telling them. You've got to hammer it into them. That's nothing like a twisting and twiddling to encourage them to remember things. It concentrates their minds wonderfully. Let's take a look at our second question. Why are the words telling and hammer written in italics for two marks? Say your answer out loud and then make a note of your ideas on your piece of paper or in your home learning book. Press play once you are ready. The text is organised in this way in order to emphasise the fact that Miss Trunchbull is not going to just tell the child, but instead is about to make him remember by showing him in a cruel way. So I know that these words are written in italics to place emphasis on them. Well done if you got a similar answer. Let's continue. You could do them permanent damage, Miss Trunchbull, Miss Honey cried out. Oh, I have. I'm quite sure I have, the Trunchbull answered, grinning. Eric's ears will have stretched quite considerably in the last couple of minutes. They'll be much longer now than they were before. There's nothing wrong with that, Miss Honey. It'll give him an interesting pixie look for the rest of his life. But, Miss Trunchbull... Oh, do shut up, Miss Honey. You're as wet as any of them. If you can't cope in here, then you can go find a job at some Cottonwood private school for rich brats. When you have been teaching for as long as I have, you'll realise that it's no good at all being kind to children. Read Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Honey, by Mr Dickens. Read about Mr Watford Squeers, the admirable headmaster of Do the Boys Hall. He knew how to handle the little brutes, didn't he? He knew how to use the birch, didn't he? He kept their backsides so warm you could have fried eggs and bacon on them. A fine book, that. But I don't suppose this bunch of morons we've got here will ever read it, because by the look of them, they are never going to learn to read anything. I've read it, Matilda said, quietly. The trunchbull flicked her head round and looked carefully at the small girl with dark hair and deep brown eyes, sitting in the second row. What did you say? she asked sharply. I said I've read it, Miss Trunchbull. Read what? Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Trunchbull. You were lying to me, madame, the trunchbull shouted, glaring at Matilda. I doubt there is a single child in the entire school who has read that book. And here you are, an unhatched shrimp, sitting in the lowest form there is, trying to tell me a whooping great lie, like that. Why do you do it? You must take me for a fool. Do you take me for a fool, child? Well, Matilda said, then she hesitated. She would have liked to have said, yes, I jolly well do. But that would have been suicide. Well, she said. 
still hesitating, still refusing to say no. The trunchbull sensed what the child was thinking and she didn't like it. Stand up when you speak to me, she snapped. What is your name? Matilda stood up and said, My name is Matilda Wormwood, Miss Trunchbull. Wormwood, is it? The trunchbull said. In that case, you must be the daughter of the man who owns Wormwood Motors. Yes, Miss Trunchbull. He's a crook, the trunchbull shouted. A week ago, he sold me a second-hand car that he he said was almost new. I thought he was a splendid fellow then. But this morning, while I was driving that car through the village, the entire engine fell out onto the road. The whole thing was filled with sawdust. The man's a thir- a thief and a robber. I'll have his skin for sausages. You see if I don't. He's clever at his business, Matilda said. Clever my foot, the trunchbull shouted. Miss Honey tells me that you are meant to be clever too. Well, madame, I don't like clever people. They are all crooked. You are most certainly crooked. Before I fell out with your father, he told me some very nasty stories about the way you behaved at home. But you'd better not try anything in this school, young lady. I shall be keeping a very careful eye on you from now on. Sit down and keep quiet. And that is the end of our chapter. Let's take a look at our last question. I shall be keeping a very careful eye on you from now on. Sit down and keep quiet. Why has the author chosen to end the chapter like this? Say your answer out loud and then make a note of your ideas on your piece of paper or in your home learning book. Press play once you are ready. Here's my answer. It's very clever the way the author ends the chapter because it highlights Matilda's brilliance and how extraordinary she has been portrayed as throughout the story. Matilda is the only child that we have read about so far that Miss Trunchbull has given a warning to before punishing them. So the author has left the chapter like this to emphasise the fact that all of the other children have not got away with being cheeky or answering or speaking to Miss Trunchbull about things, or even they haven't had a chance to communicate with her much. She's just kind of asked them questions and they have to get them correct. With Matilda, we can see that it's almost like Miss Trunchbull has given her a chance and said that she's going to be keeping her eye on her rather than actually straight away punishing her. Well done if you noticed something similar. Tomorrow, we will finish reading Matilda and we will carry on evaluating. On your piece of paper or in your home learning book, write a few sentences or a short paragraph answering the following question. Do you think Matilda will eventually receive a punishment from Miss Trunchbull? Explain why you think this.